Where do the birds go? And why do they come back? That's what we're going to talk about today. Intuitions are like migratory birds. They come without a map, without a reason. I meet Ray. Today, we're going to talk about bird migration. People have been interested in it forever. For instance, the Book of Job, the Book of Jeremiah, Hesiod, Homer, Herodotus, Aristotle, all discussed bird migration. And that was at least 3,000 years ago. Aristotle noted that a crane goes from the steppes of Scythia all the way to the headwaters of the Nile. Pliny the Elder also recorded the same thing. Jeremiah said, The stork in the heavens knows its season, and the turtle dove, the swift, and the crane keep the time of their arrival. But sometimes we lose knowledge, too. In the 1700s, they started thinking that birds buried themselves in the ground and never did migration at all. That's why they turn brown. In my area, we have something called a bobolink, very vibrant yellow and black in the males. When it gets past breeding time, they turn brown like their mates. So their theory was, oh, the reason they're getting all brown is because of the soil they're digging themselves into. Or sometimes even weirder, they thought that the birds flew to the moon, I guess because sometimes you see them flying up towards the moon and the light of the moon shows them. They thought they were actually going to the moon, which was silly. They should have used the ancient wisdoms of Jeremiah, Job, Aristotle, Pliny the Elder, all of those guys, and figured out that they had it right. Birds were migrating, not burying themselves in the ground. But one German hunter found that there was a stork that had an arrow from Africa in its neck. And suddenly he puts the whole thing together. Oh, these birds are going to Africa. That's how come they're gone. They're not burying themselves in the ground took a long time to get back to that place where they understood bird migration. Sheesh, why do we just disregard things because it's old knowledge? Sometimes it's easier to notice the migrations, like when you're talking about the swallows when they go into big groups all together. There are lots of historical references all the way back to the 1700s about swallow migration. The general path of migration is north to south, but it diverts a little bit, and birds don't take the same route every year. In the United States, We have eastern birds that are east of the Rocky Mountains, and they'll go up from Texas, the Gulf of Mexico, Florida, maybe even South America, Brazil, and then come up north. And many of them are headed to the Arctic, where they're going to breed their next group of chicks. But there are birds that stay here near me in wintertime, but they still migrate in summertime further north. Eagles, for example, are here throughout the winter. They love to hunt. And they even breed their chicks here. But when it comes to summertime, maybe they don't like the hot, they go all the way up to the Arctic. And then they fly back down with some of their chicks not returning to the same area. This allows them to have diversity in their genetic makeup so you don't get too much inbreeding. Right? That makes sense. Bird migration is an opportunity for the birds, but it is for us too. They stop by places they don't live. They stop over by me. So they can feed and rest and do all the important things before their last stretch of their trip to the Arctic. And that's when Em and I, we go out there every day. From now until basically the end of May, we are doing nothing but bird watching, catching those birds on their way up north. It is such a great time to see so many birds and we are on track to having our best year ever. So that's why you'll see a ton of bird watchers out during those migration times to catch a glimpse of a bird that doesn't live near them, but flies by them. So I mentioned some birds go towards the easterly direction, east of the Rocky Mountains, but there are some other routes in the United States as well. Birds on the West Coast that will come up also from South Central America and come up west of the Rocky Mountains. And then there are some varieties of birds that are just in the Rockies. So you'll notice in the United States, most birds are separated between Eastern birds, Western birds, and some books even do Rocky Mountain birds. Meanwhile, in Europe, a lot of their birds go to Africa. Some of them even will go to India or that far south in that direction. But for Asia, you'll get birds that are going south to Australia and other southern locations. And then there's what they call the flyaway zone, where they cross over but go towards more Japan, northern China, and northern Russia. And some of them will even go to Alaska. And the birds in Iceland, They think, wait a minute, am I in North America or am I in Europe? I can't figure it out. 
Well, the island is split into two, so they don't really care which continent they're going to. But we've been lucky here. We've been getting some Icelandic gulls flying all the way this far west, so we get a chance to see them too. These routes are even determined by stars. There were groups of experiments where they put birds in planetariums and showed them the wrong stars. And sure enough, it messed up their natural sense of north and south. Or they tried to control the birds' other senses to see if just the stars alone could help them navigate. And guess what? It can. So the stars are a big part of where birds know which direction to go. Then they tried to block out certain stars and came to the conclusion the North Star was one of the big indicators for birds which direction to go. And they added what they called a new North Star, which was Betelgeuse. Could a bird follow that as well? And it turns out they can. It's not genetic. It's not DNA. The stars they learned were the stars they depended on to fly. And the birds would align themselves with that star. Cool. Wow, I love stars too. And millions of birds can't be wrong, right? Birds can take different routes when it's spring or fall. It's not that they come up in the spring on a particular path and then they go back on a particular path. They can take different paths, particularly the smaller birds. Sometimes we get these situations where there's a hurricane and you go, oh no, the birds just left here and they're headed right for Florida. You know what? They may divert. Or we notice too that sometimes when we have a particularly harsh winter and a very cold spring, the birds will go more east towards the east coast, which can be a little bit more mild. And so they may split around us and not come through town. And then we usually have a pretty bad spring bird watching time because they just avoided this area entirely. But other times we have a nice early spring. And we start seeing some birds we never get to see. That's kind of exciting, too. It's nice to know that they can alter their route and avoid danger or bad weather in case they have to. Sometimes birds do what they call a reverse migration and they get lost. They go north instead of south or south instead of north. Or even here, we've been getting some Florida-style birds because they get disoriented by a storm. This is usually a juvenile where they do have some idea of where they go but they haven't had the experience yet and just get turned around. They eventually figure it out, but it's weird when all of a sudden you see a bird that you're not supposed to get here found at the wrong time in a location you're not expecting. But why do they go and what causes them to go is a huge point of debate. It is something that someone started investigating named William Rowan in the 1930s. And he was trying to figure out why. Is it pressure change, temperature, sunlight, food supply? Is it their biology changing? And so he tried experiments when it came to light, when he was adjusting the lights for juncos. And it turned out that he could, through manipulating the light, get them into breeding condition in the middle of winter. This proved that light had a lot to do with it. It said he wasn't treated as a hero. He was treated as a villain because he was going against current science. And so then the question goes, how do they know where to go? The other part is people believe that birds are sensitive to the Earth's migration. So they know generally which way is north and south, and they're able to then map their migration. There was a fellow named Peter Berthold in Germany, and he was doing experimentation and determined there is a southeast gene and a southwest gene. And if he started breeding them together, the birds changed their migration path. So some of it is genetic. They wonder too, and there's some research going into it, whether their genes are hooked to particular smells. They know when the berries are coming back. Or they can tell when the water is thawed, which means the water bugs are not soon behind. Even some of the cranes and ducks and other types of water birds are waiting for that critical food when they fly over and they see the open field, the corn in the field, the whatever's left of the crops, or what's open water, then they see it while they're flying in and they know that they can stop in this location and stock up on food and maybe even stay for a while. But they also feel this is a gene that can change frequently. What this author, which I'll put in the show notes, said that pattern of birds can shift. So that it's not something that's so built into them that if the weather patterns change, if this area becomes dangerous for them, 
they can shift. And then that shift will also go to their baby birds too. And they will start to learn the shift as well. I went down to visit my friend in San Juan Capistrano for the return of the swallows. And you know what? There were no swallows there. And so my friend said, you know what happens is that sometimes they go over here and sometimes they go over there. So there is variation. And way to screw up an event there, swallows. We had a great time anyway. I saw some swallows, but it ended up being a little closer towards the coast than where the celebration took place. When it comes to migration in Europe, many of them are coming from Africa. Some of them are coming from India and going north and then taking that trip back south again. Some speculation said that about 40% of birds regularly migrate. Some of them stay where they are year round. It really depends on the temperature how much sun, the length of the day, whether the food they eat goes away or sticks around. Think about it in terms of birds that eat seeds. I live in the upper Midwest and we get cold winters, but there are many plants around that have their seeds still up above the snow. So the seed birds can stick around a lot longer because there will always be something to eat. Even some of the birds that eat fruit will find dried fruit on many branches. And so for those birds that stay, like chickadees, robins, blue jays, cardinals, some might actually migrate even though they're staying in the location, but they'll just go a couple of hundred miles or a hundred miles north or south, just depending on the winter, the availability of food. I looked at the migration map for robins and they just sort of shift from the middle of America to the north of America and back down again. But we have robins here all year long. But the bug birds The ones that eat caterpillars, the ones that eat flying bugs in particular, they have to go south. They have to go where the bugs are. And so you can tell around here if we get a hard freeze and then the bugs all die, all the bug-only birds go south. They have to follow the bugs. So even if some of this is light and some of this is genetics, there are many obvious signs that a bird needs to go. They can also tell the temperature. They can tell the light changes, their food disappearing, as I just mentioned, or there are other indicators that could tell them it's either time to go or when they're coming back, how far north to go. It's always curious when you hit a certain location, the birds can get sometimes trapped in a particular area because up north hasn't thawed yet or the water isn't in the right condition quite yet. So while some of this is mechanics in their system, Other parts of it is absolute observation, or some of them require open water. And once the open water starts to freeze over, they're out of there. Sometimes they even make mistakes. They come back up, they're ready for spring. The spring's been particularly rough because it was very nice and springy in March. And then as soon as April came along, wham, 15 inches of snow. Suddenly, all those birds that were looking for things on the ground were looking for open water to swim around in, lost their potential areas. Now, it was very short-lived, so they're going to be fine and they'll be able to go and continue their migration if they're going further up north once the weather breaks up there. Or if they're going to stay here, they'll be able to start eating food, getting what they need in order to survive. There is a website that is called birdcast.info, and I'm going to put a link in the show notes to this, but what it'll show you is how many birds are flying over your area at a particular period of time, and it'll show the current migration. Right now, this night, 49 million birds are in the process of migrating north. And the pathway, you can see overall, is a little farther west than I live. They're not really coming over my state right now. Does that mean we're going to have a bad time of it, catching some of those birds? You know, it's all going to depend on the weather from here on out. But you can actually put your zip code into this particular website and it will tell you what the migration outlook looks for your area specifically. So, for example, tonight they predict about 44,000 birds flew into my county coming in from the south. They think that 75,000 birds are headed in flight in my direction. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to come right here, but it's headed my direction. 
And there's all sorts of really cool graphs showing how it looks and comparing graphs to past times. So right now, there's a lot of birds in flight. We just got a huge storm. And one of the interesting things, which we're not going to get too much of in a deep dive, but when you have a storm, our storms in the Northern Hemisphere rotate counterclockwise. And so sometimes it's a little bit easier to kind of pick up on these wind bands that are moving up from the southwest to the north and to my neck of the woods makes their flight a little bit easier. So sometimes they come in with certain storms and sometimes they leave with storms in the fall because they'll be able to get more energetic winds to help push them in the right direction. And so when I look at these maps. There's a lot of information here. Talks about how many birds, how fast they're flying, what heights they're flying at. And then it gives a really cool list of what's coming in. Right now, we have golden crown kinglets. We have fox barrels. My friend M, she just saw a fox barrel. We get ruby crown kinglets a little bit later, but we also are now starting to get kind of the shorebirds coming, the sandpipers, the black neck stilt. What's really interesting about it is it did a chart for the great white-fronted goose. They are funny little geese that have orange legs, make them a little bit different than the Canada goose that we have normally here. And when we started seeing them, we started seeing a lot of them. Now, we don't see so many of them. So it looks, if you look at this chart, accurate that they're now gone. They have migrated away from my area. So then I can use the same website, click on the bird. It will take me to eberg.org, which is the Cornell bird site. And I can see where they went. You know where they're at? They're all up in the very tip top of Canada in the Arctic. They go all the way to the top for breeding season. Some of them are even in Greenland. It's interesting to know that birds, when they migrate, their whole bodies change shape. The style of their heart, Their muscles grow, their internal organs shrink, so it uses less energy. Their ability to reproduce stops completely. That makes sense. They're not anywhere near where their nests are quite yet. And all of this allows them to put every effort, every amount of energy in their body into their big migration trip. And you might wonder, when do birds sleep? Some of them will come down and sleep in trees while they're resting up. But some of them have what they call unihemispheric sleeping which means that they're going to keep one eye open and they're going to sleep with half their brain working. Then that allows them to keep half of their brain aware to stay away from dangers. Swainson's thrush take nine second power naps while they're flying. Lucky for birds, their REM cycle only lasts about 10 seconds. And there's some other birds that just don't sleep. We'll talk about that in another podcast. So my challenge to you is find out using birdcast.info on the internet and see what kinds of birds are coming through your neck of the woods right now and see if you can't find a couple of them off that list. Maybe some of them are just visiting for a couple of days and maybe some of them are staying. Find a nest, create eggs in your very own backyard. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and if you wouldn't mind leaving a review. Reviews help other people find this podcast. And if you think that this is kind of fun and you're learning something about nature, boy, we're going to learn a lot more about nature. Tell a friend, let them know about this podcast. <laughs>